Welcome uh, everyone to another episode of Clean Tech uh, Gig. Today I have the absolute pleasure to have with me Mr. Eric uh, Bjornrud of uh, Macquarie's uh, Green Investment Group Managing Director. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric, welcome. And we're going to have an interesting discussion regarding uh, some of the current issues uh, we have as issues that concern development and the uh, uh, construction of new uh, uh, solar and wind assets. Eric, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, accepting our invitation. Without uh, taking uh, any more of your precious time, please allow me to start by asking you to give us a bit of your uh, insight. Um, I mean, GIG is an established global player on the green investment uh, side. Uh, you very recently uh, created your own development platform, a pan-European development platform, Zero Generation. Does this mean that institutional investors are now more comfortable on taking development risk and, and getting in the development process much earlier uh, than, than before. First of all, thank you for having me, Patios. Uh, and and uh, yes, I think that uh, the the creation of Zero Generation, which is the portfolio company you're talking about, and uh, our step into development risk, I think Macquarie and Green Investment Group has always been investing in development risk, but it was on very isolated circumstances. And what you see now is, a, is, a, is an acceleration of our capital into that uh, level of risk, um, which has been a combination of uh, our institution's uh, comfort around it, as we've had several successes in that, in that, um, that area of the, the development cycle. Uh, in order to accelerate this green energy transition, um, we need to be accelerating from the beginning versus coming in later in the development process. And there's a greater need for capital at that, that point. And we're really happy that we feel we've developed the competency to make those investments uh, at that stage. So I think from our perspective at Macquarie, there's certainly institutional buying, institutional knowledge, and we are there and it's manifesting in the creation of zero generation. And then we can see it alongside us that uh, the other institutional investors are starting to have more and more comfort and you see a lot more of these platform investments being made. So this is pretty much to, to control the quality from the beginning and know the projects so you can manage them better as they, as they mature. I think that is absolutely true and that's one facet of it, but it's also, uh, it's also indicative of the fact that there is a short shortage of supply of projects and the world needs more renewable generation to meet its goals and its targets. And for our industry to accelerate that, we need to get in earlier on uh, to create a bigger impact. You've touched on the investment and the fact that they, uh, we don't have enough supply of projects, mm. um, but still based on, on uh, various reports from, uh, from uh, global organizations, we need to pretty much double the investment that, on the annual investment that we have now to up to about $5 trillion a year yep. just to meet the 2050 targets. Yep. What's, your, what's your opinion? What's your reaction on that? Yeah, I think that's welcomed, I guess. The amount of investment managers that have, have started to take on capital and the amount of capital that they're taking on has seen a massive increase over the past five years. Uh, again, if you look at renewables, 10 or 15 years ago, it was a much less developed and, and, it was, and it was less mature than it is today. And as a result of that newfound maturity, uh, there is a lot of uh, attraction to it, a lot of capital is looking to go into it. You gain maturity by having institutional buy-in and knowledge of how to operate the plants, the risks around them, how the power markets work, uh, how the, the renewable generation interacts with those power markets. Uh, and there's been a lot of a lot of data gained over the past 20 years to, to be able to support uh, that type of investment for that quantum of capital. So we, we see an uptick on, on the, the ready to build asset side, and then we, we are going to see an uptick on the development stage investment as well. And looking at that and specifically discussing about the, the areas you invest uh, or the geographies you invest as, as, mm -hmm. uh, as GIG and in extension as a set of generation. I mean, how do you choose the geographies? Does um, incentives and subsidies play a significant role when you go into a market? Mm. Do you look at the maturity of the market and the, 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 the electricity market size or how mature the PPA market is? How do you choose which countries you know, to, to pick and, and go in? So I think institutions may look at that 
that question a little differently. Uh, in our case, we like to be the gateway uh, to markets where they have uh, some capital flow into it, but we expect a lot more to come in. Um, and in that context, we're looking for markets that can can replicate uh, something very similar to continental Europe or the U.S. And in that context, I'm talking about uh, some level of creditworthy firm, uh, PPA counterparty or government-backed um, hedge contract. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for some level of sophistication with the developers uh, and permitting that is uh, in line with international standards. That means the way environmental permitting is done, uh, how the developers conduct themselves through that permitting process. And then I think finally, uh, some level of capital markets in the, in the region which we're going to be investing in. Um, and that helps add a level of responsibility to the projects because you have more stakeholders now who, who have an interest in it uh, when they're investing you know, their capital or other people's capital into it. And in that context, uh, you know, those are markets we like to operate in. And then clearly, you know, what's the value proposition of, of the transaction? If you have power prices that are, you know, a super low amount and an expensive cost to build, it doesn't make sense. If you have power prices that are high and a relatively uh, moderate cost to build, then it could make sense. So as long as it has those fundamental principles that I mentioned before, it's just a question of, of the value proposition of, of doing business there. You've mentioned something uh, critical, I think. You've mentioned about people and teams and, and the importance of uh, the actual teams that are going to deliver uh, the portfolios that, uh, that are needed and, and that is mm. extremely important for your, for your selection. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate a bit on that and perhaps give us a few more criteria of how do you choose the developers on a specific market that you go and, and, uh, and yeah. cooperate with? Well, you know, development is a business where you have to interact with the local community and you have to interact with the government as well. It's really important that the custodian of that risk is prudently operating with each of those counterparties to get their buy-in. A well-developed project is a project that has all of its permits, has gotten those permits through convincing the community around it of the benefits of that project uh, and that those benefits also support that community as well as the greater global agenda. Typically, uh, to do that, you need to be very robust in the studies you produce, uh, the level of conduct when you're dealing with the community's level of conduct when you're dealing with the authorities, uh, and being very thorough. And you know, we've found that not all developers behave that way. As the project gets closer to financial close, some of those cracks start to get bigger. And with good development, those cracks never appear in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's fundamental because ultimately we are impacting a community because we're doing an infrastructure investment. We want the community to respect that. We want the government to respect that. And we want everyone to be proud of the project. So uh, that is holistically in the developer's court to manage that. So it's, it's extremely important to, to manage your ESG in a sense. Uh, uh, very prudently and, and get uh, get the, the local communities involved yeah. uh, and, and supportive of, uh, of the uh, projects that you're developing. Yeah, that's correct. And you'll see greater importance on that as more and more capital flows in, the requirements of that capital will need to be borne by the developer and the project. And they will be very um, conscious of all those different agendas to make sure that they are uh, sufficient. Moving to the other side of the market on the uh, on the bilateral contracts and the PPAs that uh, that we see <laughs> that we see forming, there are of course different sort of markets with different maturity levels. Um, how do you read the current PPA market, and what sort of PPAs um, uh, can you uh, you know can you discuss or? <laughs> Or, uh, you know, uh, what are you negotiating at the moment? <laughs> what sort of types of PPAs are you negotiating? Yeah. The renewables market, as a starting point, is it has seen glimpses of, of accepting merchant price exposure. But by and large, it's fundamentally premised on having a solid revenue contract, which historically has been with the government and now has moved more towards corporates. And it's a nice transition because the corporates are looking to uh, decarbonize their platforms and their institutions and power intensive or electricity intensive businesses uh, benefit greatly from the long-term contracts they can get from wind farms and solar farms and, and renewable generation and conversely the renewable generators benefit from having strong credits contracting their power for long periods of time so 
you know, our experience has been uh, very focused on that market. We have a desk that focuses solely on outreach to that market and, and making sure we have a good understanding of where it stands. Uh, we've seen a transition from uh, pay as produced PPAs, which is something where a corporate would take a lot of the production risk of the wind farm or the solar farm to fixed volume PPAs to better slot into a corporate's uh, power needs. Uh, and then it, that in turn puts some more risk on the project. We think that's probably a suitable place for it because ultimately a project owner has more understanding of their ability to generate or not generate power at certain times than the than the consumer of it. And in that context, uh, you need to do that appropriately and structured appropriately. Those are called fixed volume PPAs, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to tenor, uh, we've seen a mix there. You know, Green Investment Group has done almost 30 year long PPAs, 29 year long PPA in the Nordics with some of the biggest power consumers in the world. Uh, we've done 10 to 15 year PPAs with utility traders. Uh, and we've also looked at other, you know, uh, other corporates who um, you know produce a whole wide range of products that are looking to get involved in this. Uh, the tech companies who have the big data centers, you know, they're a clear target for this. They want to decarbonize. Uh, they need to consume a lot of power. They're located in regions that are in some ways isolated, so they're close to these resources. So there's a lot of factors converging that make a lot of sense. Uh, for the corporates and the and the projects, but you've done deals in the Nordics. You're um, you're, you're uh, very active in the UK, but mm -hmm. then you're also active in in, in South Europe, like mm -hmm. Italy, and Greece. Yep, there's obviously a gap there. We're yep. just seeing um, uh, corporates uh, in Greece trying to venture into bilateral contracts and PPAs. Yeah, and obviously there the maturity level is is completely different. So. What would be the sort of first step that you would see on a non-mature market? Is it pay us, pay us, produce sort of PPAs that everybody's yeah. easy to understand and negotiate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, as you know, we're we're in Greece right now, looking at these opportunities. Uh, we think uh, the pay us, produce, which is which is which is an easy to take on project for the project itself, contract for the project itself is something that we would like to discuss in that region. I think, generally speaking, the level, the maturity of the sponsor engaging with that client or that consumer is quite important because if you're going to be doing a new PPA and it's one of your first ventures into it, you want to make sure you're dealing with a, a development partner that is uh, that has done their job correctly and that it, there's a reliable project standing behind it and you want to make sure the sponsor, the owner of it, is someone that uh, is a reliable international counterparty that can stand behind the project and, and can provide the right sort of level of guarantees for the project. Exactly. But it, it is extremely important and we see, and I can I can say that as well, that we see more and more corporates that, that they want to venture into uh, bilateral contracts uh, that they are extremely interested uh, on, the, on the development process and the actual quality of the sites that, yeah. uh, that are going to engage uh, uh, over the PPA contract. Now, we, we live or we, we go through an energy crisis mm -hmm. and you can put a lot of hats on that and you can, you can see it from a different perspective. My take is that it's primarily a gas crisis. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion? Do you think we're going to have de-escalation of prices? Do you think that renewables and storage mm -hmm. are going to be part of, the, uh, part of the answer? I think I'll start with the last question first, which is I do believe renewables and storage will be a large part of the answer in the future, and and that's driven by elements that uh, are decoupled from the pricing uh, economics of uh, the other uh, commodities that would be used to fuel the fuel the system. I think it's driven more by the need for more power and the way to create that generation in a way that's in line with the principles of you know the future our, our, ourselves today and the future of the world in, in the context of what people want to see and have. Um, when it comes to the kind of short-term crisis we just experienced, which was driven mostly by the gas pricing, I think that's just a reminder uh, of how volatile our system can be uh, in circumstances where supply is short. And in that context, you know, it's clear that renewable generation doesn't experience those uh, types of volatile moments. It's also a good justification for corporates who would be on the receiving end of something along those lines to hedge their power with reliable generators that um, can provide stability in those circumstances. Uh, 
and then from that perspective uh, you know I think it's it's just a good reminder on on why long-term power stability is a is a goal for for corporates however in order to in order to accelerate adaptation of renewables and build more projects we've yeah. already discussed and addressed the, the shortage on the supply of qualitative uh, projects mm -hmm. but also during uh, you know during the uh, the last few months we've seen uh, a logistical risk that all of us need to somehow deal with panel prices increasing uh, not being able to fix uh, contracts for specific deliveries of mm -hmm. quantities I mean you're dealing with I think Cerro now has about eight gigawatts around Europe mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken yeah so that's a massive volume of projects to be built. Yep. Um, how do you deal with it? Uh, how do you deal with all of that? And is it a, a waiting game or is it mm. as, as panel manufacturers perhaps say, you know, uh, people don't actually care about panel prices, they just want to build projects. So yeah. which, which is true pretty much. It is a, a hurdle that we need to overcome right now. Uh, and it'd be difficult to put a solution on it uh, right away. Uh, you've got a lot of competing dynamics uh, when you build these generating plants. You, you want to deliver the lowest cost of power of electricity to your consumers. In order to do that, you need to lower the cost of capital on the project, which means you need reliability and certainty, both in, in how you build it, the cost to build it, and then how you operate it. Uh, and then you also need to factor in the cost to build it in the first place. So uh, all the things you've mentioned have been relatively disruptive in the plan to build a renewable energy generating plan. Uh, and we are working through it. I think it highlights the impact of the global economy on, as, you know, on a local project because uh, these pieces are coming from everywhere and it also reflects uh, how the whole world is involved with making these projects happen. Uh, and I think for me, that's one, a fascinating thing. And then it's also a complex thing that we need to better manage. But this is part of the further maturation of the of the renewables business that you know we've gotten to a point now where we're at a pretty competitive LCOE subsidies are less needed than they were before uh, we're now at a point where we got to start to find ways to hedge and to make the supply chains more reliable in these times of times of crisis I guess absolutely and and I would add to that that um, what we would like also to see from the governments as we have COP26 now to start lifting investment barriers and yeah. and you know, start uh, eliminating bottlenecks. Yeah. I think one of the biggest um, bottlenecks that we have around Europe at the moment is, is the grid. Yeah. And the grid is not just, uh, you know, it's not catching up as fast as, they, as, as it should yeah. in order to allow more renewables uh, to, uh, to enter into the system. Mm -hmm. Please allow a, a provocative question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm dealing with, uh, with an institutional investor here. There is always this sort of question about what is more important? Is it CAPEX? Is it OPEX? You know, seeing this sort of uh, extension in the lifetime of the assets from 20, 25 years now to 40, even further, yep. it creates more pressure and, and puts OPEX in the center of the discussion, especially, you know, for people that are called upon to service and make sure that the asset is operating for, for yep. such, a long, such a long period of time. But there's always this sort of if you would like disagreement that once the deal is made, mm. it's somebody else's problem down the line and the deal team doesn't actually care. Yeah. So yeah. What's, what's your take on that? I'm going to go back to the, the theme of maturity that I, I keep uh, pressing on. And in that context, um, as this industry has matured, uh, so have the standards along with how you build, how you operate. Um, and there's a realization that the that the actual renewable generating plants, wind farms, solar farms, they can last longer than, than the lives that we were giving them in the first place. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that the uh, level of operations and prudence around that needs to be reflective of those long-term uh, hold periods. And ultimately, the end owner of these plants is long-term capital. And that long-term capital cares very much about uh, the the robustness of the operations plan and the ability for that wind farm or solar plant to generate over that period of life. So uh, we're just going through an exercise right now where we're trying to get very specific on how we extend the life, the level of investment we need, not just now, but later in the future, 
accounting for that, um, uh, reserving, preser reserving capital for that. Uh, and I think, you know, that's part of keeping it mature is in maturing it further is, is to make sure that we are doing things prudently. We're delivering on the, the production we need to deliver on. And it's, and it's playing through to the off takers because the off takers care if you deliver your power too, because they have a stake in that game as well. And then this is, this is one of the, one of the issues with all the, uh, with all the new developments that as we have more assets being connected to PPA contracts, mm. it will be extremely important for the asset to be operating uh, on the right sort of on the optimum level, if you would like. Yep. Um, because there will be a lot of penalties on the PPA contracts for the production, failure production. Yep. So how we build and how we optimize plans at the beginning before even we start construction yep. becomes much more important. However, this has an impact, obviously, on the sale price. Yep. So is there a golden rule, do you think? Do you think that the off-takers will be much more willing to take on quality uh, uh, assets and, and, and perhaps pay a premium as you, get a, as you get a premium car that you pay the quality? Do you think that this will apply here as well? It depends on who's making that decision, but I can, and I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for ourselves in, it, in the sense that uh, we are in the business of accelerating our uh, impact on the renewable world. Uh, we have been developing multiple plants and bringing those plants to market where long-term capital gets traded out. Uh, we are a believer in uh, being more robust on those lines because we need the whole industry and as much product to be an industry that works and is delivering on the obligations. And ultimately what that'll do is it'll lower the cost of capital. So uh, in some circumstances, uh, by being robust, cost of capital may not have caught up to that point yet, but we found that over time, cost of capital eventually goes down, and in that context, you have more responsibility to deliver on that on that plant. And for us, it's it's very important that we set an operational plan that that is fit for purpose for the investment thesis that we're providing. Please allow a, a last question, Eric. Uh, we are here in London in the UK. We have uh, COP26 in, uh, in, in Glasgow, and we've been, we've been witnessing extreme phenomena over the summer with floods in North Europe, mm -hmm. with wildfires uh, in the States and in South of Europe. What do you expect from COP26? What, what do you, as, as Eric, yeah. living, living GIG aside, yeah. What do you expect as an outcome? I expect more call to arms. So uh, I guess in simple terms, more capital will flow into the business. Uh, I expect more uh, economies to try and achieve zero emissions. Uh, and I expect more attention on, uh, on a global basis versus on a country or regional basis uh, because uh, I think it's becoming more and more evident that we need to be uh, investing in this, uh, not just from a financial standpoint, but from a policy standpoint, from a um, skill set workforce standpoint. And uh, I, expect, I expect things to keep, to keep changing and to keep moving in the right direction. And on that, thank you very much for your time, Eric. It was a pleasure. And thank you for, for joining us in Clean Tech Geek. Yeah, thank you very much. Great to have you.